Good morning to the Christchurch Howick family, and what a lovely warm welcome for everyone on this incredibly cold morning. Um, my name is Liz Dupree. I live in Amber Glen. <laughs> and the warmth of the welcome is really on these rather chilly days is wonderful after a busy week and, the, and it just seems to be getting colder and colder. Anyway, if there are any visitors today, please feel just as warmly welcomed as we can. It's lovely to have you here and I hope that um, I hope that the service will be a blessing to you. And then uh, just a reminder of your cell phones, could you either switch them off or put them on silent for us, please. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 104, verses 1 to 3. Praise the Lord, O my, o my soul, Lord my God. You are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. The Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beams of his upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. Would you like to stand please? And we'll sing the openings, uh, beautiful hymn. <laughs> it's, I'm sure it's got Methodist roots. <laughs> I'm a Methodist, but I love being here. Okay, would you stand please? join us in the confession. O oh Lord, our God, you know us better than we know ourselves. You know that we are sinners and that his our thoughts, words, and deeds. You know that without Christ, we would not be welcomed in your presence. Because Jesus died to cover all our offenses, I dare not to ask for your forgiveness. Please remove the memory of them from your sight as far as East is from West. Help us to trust more fully in Jesus, our Lord and Savior, until that day when in keeping with a promise 
we will look upon his beauty in your house for the rest of eternity. Um, really uh, good to welcome you all to Christchurch. My name is Andy Pike. Um, I'm the rector here. A couple of things for your attention. Guys, uh, this one's for you. Remember this Saturday coming, 8 o'clock at Yellowwood Cafe. Uh, this would be your last chance last chance to book your place. Uh, think of a friend you might be able to bring along. It'll be really good for us to gather together around some good food and around God's word. Karen is going to be bringing us a passage from, from God's word. So do get your name down. I think there will be a list on that table. Um, good. So uh, get your name down. Last chance today. And uh, then Karen is going to come and bring us up to date uh, with our missionary of the month. Thanks, Karen. Morning, everyone. A number of weeks ago, we had the privilege of uh, the man who and family who are part of this ministry. Uh, 930 is being recorded, so we can't use their names and say where they are. Um, but they're ministering in an area that is hostile to the gospel. And um, I just thought it would be a great thing for us to to just pray uh, for for them as as a family and for their their ministry. Um, so let let us bow and let us let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for Kharat and family. We just thank you for the way in which you have brought them to yourself. And you've laid on their heart this desire, Lord, that meant years, decades, preparing for this ministry in the Far East. We thank you that you've raised them up, that you've sent them out, that you've provided for them. We just think of this time of home assignment that they were here in South Africa for, just raising uh, awareness and looking for prayer partners and those who could help um, in the work financially supporting it. Lord, we, we do want to pray for great wisdom and grace. You've given them huge opportunities to make a radical difference in a very hard context with people that are hostile to the gospel. So we pray for wisdom, for strategy, but also supernatural wisdom. Lord, uh, just lead and guide them. We pray for gospel opportunities. Lord, you've already given them relationships and we pray for other opportunities. We thank you for the unreached areas that they've been given access to in the, in, in, in the last little while. We thank you for the work that they are doing with minorities. And Lord, we pray that you would be just opening up the hearts of those that they're reaching out to in the light of the recent upheavals. Lord, we pray not just for gospel opportunities, but we pray for the miracle of conversions, that as they proclaim this gospel of life and hope in a dead and lost society, that you would open up blind eyes and unstop deaf ears and regenerate dead hearts, that families would change, that communities would change. So we do pray that you would raise up indigenous gospel workers. Lord, we also pray for their family needs. Um, they've just you know, uh, expressed their, their, their needs for the education of their children, just the logistics of educating your children when you are in a foreign land, um, just the financial needs, the logistics. We just pray, Lord, that you would enable them to educate their children in a way that would be helpful and would honor you. We pray for protection and provision for physical protection, but also spiritual protection. We know, Lord, that those that are at the coalface of ministry are often under hectic attack because the devil doesn't want your word of life to go out. So please protect them as a family. And we pray for continued gospel faithfulness for them as a family, for the ministry organization and gospel workers. Would you grant them and their children the ability to be growing in the knowledge and the love of Jesus so that they can be effective gospel witnesses to the glory of your name. Amen. Just at the back on the pre-mission state uh, station, there, there is a little uh, card that you can put up on your fridge 
to be lifting them up in prayer as a family uh, or slipping into your Bible. Um, so maybe you do want to lift this family up um, just as you go out at the back in the mission station. Thanks, Andy. Well, if I can ask that the stewards take up the collection for the work of the gospel, some of this money will find its way to that family that we're speaking about and that part of the world. So thank you very much. Great, let's just bow and pray for a minute. Father, we do pray for those who have to decide how to allocate this money, that you would give them wisdom and keep them gospel focused in all they do. In Jesus' name, amen. I do think we need a sunny picture on a cold winter's day, don't we? Rather than a cold picture on a cold day. Friends, there are two more announcements, but we just wanted to give special um, focus to them. So um, the first one, um, I'm going to do the second Kerry Ann is going to do, and it has to do with our car park. Uh, you, you don't need to be told. I'm sure you've felt your shock absorbers have been feeling certainly that our car park is in a sorry state. Um, we, you might remember a couple of years before COVID, we started uh, reshaping it, trying to just uh, get, get the angles right. And that was completed. And then COVID came along. And I'm happy to say to you that the council has been working very hard for a very long time, actually, to try and figure out what we're going to do about our car park. And they've come up with a plan, which I'm going to announce today. Um, it's a two-phased plan, um, and so we're going to do what we can to begin with, and then as things progress, we'll see how we go for the second phase as need, as the needs grow of the church. So here's what, uh, that's what we've got at the moment, dongas and pits and mud and slush in the summer when the rains come, and here's what we're planning to do uh, going forward. Um, so everything I'm going to present now is what we want to do uh, as soon as we can in phase one. The first thing is to look at our access road down the side. Um, we need a, a dual carriageway. We need two-way traffic to be able to travel on that road. At the moment, it's a bit of a trouble, eight o'clock people leaving, nine o'clock people arriving. Um, it's not easy to get you know, traffic going both ways, um, and that needs to get sorted out. So the first thing is to widen that road um, and tar it. So that's the first thing we're going to do. Um, the second thing is to look at the actual uh, car park itself. That's the final plan, uh, artist's impression, actually Andy's impression. Um, but it's all been computer designed. Um, the plans have been drawn up. Um, the final numbers are going to be available in the next few days, the actual amount that we can, uh, can base everything on, and then it will go out to tender. But what we're wanting to look at is that road coming down the side of the church, two directions, and then the actual car park itself. Uh, from where the current uh, tarred ring road is up, we're planning uh, to tar. Not completely. You can see there's lots of green there places for trees and shrubs, but we're going to try and get in 48 parking bays on tar so that you don't get stuck. You don't have to walk through mud to get to the church. Um, it will be, it's, it's been very carefully designed so that the flow of traffic has been thought of. Uh, the bays are angled so you can get in and out easily without reversing into each other. Um, at the moment, it's pretty much just a scrum. First come, first served, and good luck to the rest. Uh, this will be organized. Uh, each bay will be demarcated, and the plan is to, to get some order and some um, and make it really accessible to come to church, even in the worst weather. That'll be phase one, the, the gates, widening the gates, getting the driveway in, getting 48 uh, bays uh, tarred for us. Phase two, somewhere down the line, will be to look at the bottom part of our property. Uh, there is place down there for another 18 bays, um, but at the moment what, we'll, what we're planning to do in phase one is preparing that area one day to be possibly uh, tarred, but at this stage to be grassed, and it'll be available for parking on the grass as and when needed, but also for kids to play on uh, for us to have access to a nice flat grassed area uh, down where all the blackjacks uh, and uh, and that is when you stand on our veranda, our property actually goes way beyond what you can see. And the idea is to flatten that, prepare that, use that for overflow parking. So the big question is, the million dollar question, 
how much is this all going to cost? Um, so we've got preliminary estimates very uh, done by experts, um, but the final number is going to come this week. Uh, we're estimating that we need about 1.3 to 1.4 million to do phase one. Okay, that's a lot of money. But, and there's always a, this is a good but, amazingly, God has given us a million rand to get this going. Someone has donated a million rand uh, towards this car park. Uh, he is sick and tired of driving on it <laughs> at the moment. And he has said he will put a million rand towards our car park, which leaves us to raise uh, the balance, okay, for phase one. The entire project, in case someone wants to give us another million, we'll cover it. Uh, we're thinking about 1.9 would do everything, okay, all the bells and the whistles, but we're not looking at 1.9, we're looking at 1.3 uh, to, to get a, a proper car park that actually will be a gift to the next generation that takes over this church. It should last, you know, 10, 15 years if we do it properly now. Uh, and, and not having this regular maintenance the whole time and regular washaways whenever there's rain. Andy has been driving that. Andy Hillman, the other one, he's been driving that. He's got many, many years of experience with car parks. He's a civil engineer. He'll be available afterwards to answer any questions. So if you want to come forward um, after the service, grab a cup of tea. Andy will be milling around here. He can give you uh, any information you want on that. So there we go. That's where we stand uh, at the moment. Uh, we're hoping to get this done before the first rains come again. Is that all right? Bit of a shock, I know. But, you know, spa and pick and pay don't put up shopping centers without car parks, nor do schools, and churches shouldn't either. So there we go. I'm going to ask Kerry Ann if she'll come forward with our second uh, announcement. Come up here, Kerry Ann. Hi everyone. So um, I'm here to make an announcement, especially for the ladies. Um, and this is, is a little bit in the future. It's the 7th of September, but I just want you to make a note. And if you use a diary, if you use your phone, to please make make a note within book that day. Um, so so we as a as a denomination have had ladies conferences annually for years actually um but since covid everything did kind of fall apart a bit uh, we used to have uh, mostly most often a coastal conference and then we'd have a midlands conference so people didn't have to travel too far but um yeah, after COVID, they just took a while to to happen again. So last year, we ordered, we organized the sort of last minute one just in Waterfall. And I know it was hard for people to get there from, from this side of the world. But the great news is we're back to normal. There's going to be a coastal one this year. And we're having our own Midlands Ladies Conference for our full reach in, at Christchurch, Peter Maritzburg on the 7th of September. So that's what I'm asking you to please put that in your diaries. We've got Jo Taylor from Cape Town coming up. Um, we're flying her especially for that. And she's a wonderfully gifted Bible teacher. She's going to be teaching us from the book of Habakkuk on this theme, How Long, O Lord, Living by Faith in a Broken World. And I'm sure all of us, we, we feel the brokenness of our world every day. And sometimes there is really a, a sense of hopelessness um, as we as we get, just get caught up in the challenges of our world and of our lives. And so it'll be a wonderful morning to refocus us on Jesus, on, on our Heavenly Father, who is in control of, of all things. I do want to encourage you. I know Maritzburg can feel like a bit of a drive, and Christchurch, Peter Maritzburg, feels like it's not in the greatest area. But what we're going to do is be willing to drive a combi down with the ladies in. I can lift. We've got a few ladies who are willing to drive their vehicles, and so you can easily catch a lift with somebody. So please don't let that be a reason not to come. Um, it really will be a wonderful morning. And if you haven't been to one of the ladies' conferences before, there's just really something special about it. all the ladies from five or six churches around us will also be invited all coming together singing together listening to god's word together faithfully taught by by a gifted woman who is who, who is teaching the bible to us and so yeah please do as i say mark in your diaries there will there will be sign up details soon if you would like to there there should be a list on the table you can write your name down say you're keen to come and i'll make sure when the when the sign up details are finalized that you receive those but yes, please do remember that. 7th of September, it's 8.30 to 1.30, pretty much just the morning. Um, and we would love to have you there. Thank you.
Thanks, Kirian. My friends, I'm going to ask if Steve will come forward and lead us now in prayer. Thank you, Steve. Right, let us pray. Just a, a verse from Psalm 18, verse 2. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer in whom I take refuge. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I'm saved from my enemies. Now the colleague for, for the special prayer for today, Almighty God, whose never failing power governs all things in heaven and earth, we humbly ask you to put away from us all things hurtful and to give us those things that are good for us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We thank you, O Lord, that your Holy Spirit governs and sanctifies the body of the church. We pray for our members and leaders here at Christ Church Howick that we may honor and serve you in all aspects of our lives. We thank you for the message of the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, through which our redemption is proclaimed, and that many people will respond in faith and receive pardon and your gift of eternal life. Lord, your word tells us that you do not desire the death of a sinner, but rather they should turn to you and live. And so we pray for those we know and love who do not trust in you, that you will have mercy on them and bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus as their Savior, that they together with us may live to the honor of your name. Almighty God, bless our land, its rulers and people, Lord, you know that all is not well in the country, where there is corruption and lawlessness amongst our leaders. We pray that you will intervene to the glory of your name and the upholding of your laws. We pray especially at this time for the new government of national unity and for all those elected to cabinet positions that those who have been elected to govern our country will do so in a righteous and godly manner. Grant that all may live in obedience to your word and follow after truth, righteousness, and justice to the glory of your holy name. Almighty and merciful Father, you told us not to think of ourselves only, but to remember the needs of others. We pray for all in want or need, for the sick in body or mind, for the poor and lowly, and for those in distress and despair, and for all have strayed from, from your way. Merciful Lord, deliver them, strengthen them and restore their faith. Bless and help them. Lord, some of us here also have problems, financial or other, or we have sorrows, and even mourn the loss of loved ones. Go before us, Lord, with your most gracious favor and grant us your constant help that in all our works begun, continued, and ended, we may glorify your holy name and by your mercy receive everlasting life. God, who wonderfully created us and even more wonderfully restored our humanity, strengthen us by your Holy Spirit to triumph over suffering and death and grant us eternal joy. And so, Lord, we ask that you will hear us as we lay these prayers and petitions before you. And we trust that in your great mercy, you will answer our requests through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, friends, let's stand and sing our second song this morning. In Christ alone, my hope is found. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song, his cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving ceases, my comforter.
So why don't you take a seat? Well, friends, we've had a little break from the book of Acts. Uh, we we're in chapter 8, but um, we had two weeks off, thanks to Karen for uh, preaching for me, giving me a little bit of a break. But now we're back in chapter 8 of Acts. So look that up on your cell phones or in Bibles, which you'll find on either side of the, of the room there. Last time we finished off looking at the martyrdom of an early Christian deacon called Stephen. Uh, they, he had to appear, do you remember, before the Sanhedrin, uh, the same high court of Israel who had sentenced Jesus to death. And they sentenced Stephen to death. And not only sentenced him to death, but actually carried out the stoning themselves. We also saw, saw how that event sparked widespread persecution of the church. In fact, in chapter 8, verse 4, we read, those who had been scattered because of the persecution preached the word wherever they went. In chapters 6 and 7, we had seen how the resurrected Jesus had used Stephen to present the Christian gospel to the leaders of the Jewish nation. And now in today's passage, we're going to see how Jesus takes another deacon, uh, not, a, not an apostle, not an ordained guy, just a deacon like Stephen, this time a guy called Philip, and how Jesus uses Philip to take the gospel to none other than the Samaritans. And then he takes it on to an Ethiopian, an Ethiopian court official, who then takes it across to Africa. And in that way, the gospel reaches Africa before it reaches Europe. Well, let's listen now as we hear our reading from Liz and Felicity as they bring us chapter 8 of the book of Acts. We're reading from Acts chapter 8, verse 1, beginning at verse 1. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered without, throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered 
preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now for some time, a man called Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. Continuing the reading, Acts 18, 14 to 25. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money? You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. This is the word of the Lord. So I've entitled our sermon this morning, The Gospel Goes Cross-Border, because that's what it does. And I think the first thing that Luke wants us to notice as he records uh, these events for us is that the gospel is for outside outsiders too. Now, to really understand what's going on here uh, in Acts 8, I'm afraid we need to talk a little bit about geography and history. I know not everyone's favorite subjects. But did you notice that the section starts off by telling us that the Christians from Jerusalem were scattered throughout Judea, the province around Jerusalem, and Samaria, the province to the north of Judea. Up to now, everything we've read in the book of Acts has taken place in Jerusalem, the capital of Judea, down south. As a great persecution breaks out against the church, and Christians share the gospel on the highways and byways as they run for their lives in every direction. And in our passage today, Luke traces the steps of Philip, who leaves Jerusalem, and he decides to head up north to this area called Samaria. Now, the eagle-eyed among you would have noticed that the region of Samaria is mentioned no less than four times in that reading. So it must be really important. There's something that Luke doesn't want us to miss out on. The background to this is that about 900 years before Christ, there was a civil war in the original kingdom of Israel. After King Solomon died, the kingdom of Israel split into two kingdoms, 
is confusingly called the Kingdom of Israel uh, up north. The ten tribes that broke away retained the title Kingdom of Israel. But then a second kingdom, the Kingdom of Judah, formed down south with, with two uh, tribes making up the Kingdom of Judah. These two kingdoms became enemies. Can you believe it? These are the people of God uh, that are now at civil war with each other, at each other's throats. They were half-brothers. They were all descendants of the same ancestor, Abraham, but now they're at war. Now, the southern kingdom of Judah, with Jerusalem as its capital, was only mostly bad. In other words, there were a few times when the kings of that southern kingdom came to their senses, and that kingdom worshipped the true and the living God. But it was a completely different story up north. The northern kingdom of Israel, also called Samaria or Ephraim, they were only bad all the time. And I'm not joking. Every single king of the north, without exception, was idolatrous. And despite God sending them prophet after prophet to warn them, they didn't care. And they even killed some of those prophets whom God sent. When that split between north and south happened, Jeroboam, son of Nebat, king of the north, there he is, a nice photograph taken uh, when, when he became king. I'm only joking. Jeroboam decided he didn't want his people traveling down to Judah, to Jerusalem, to the temple anymore. So he did what any king with any common sense would do. He built not one, but two replicas of God's temple in Jerusalem. And he placed one up north in Dan and one down south in Bethel. You can see them on the map there to save his people the trouble of having to go get, you know, visas and passports and go to the enemy and worship in Jerusalem. And then he went and built not one, but two golden calves. Can you believe it? One for each of those temples for his people to go and worship. At the end of his life, God sent a message to Jeroboam. You have done more evil than all who lived before you. You have made for yourself other gods, idols made of metal, with two golden calves, among many others. You have aroused my anger and turned your back on me. And so after repeated warnings, the northern kingdom or Samaria came under the judgment of God. They had been practicing child sacrifice. The kings were burning their own children as burnt offerings, burning them alive as burnt offerings. They were involved in necromancy, speaking to the dead. They were involved in slavery. They were selling their own people as slaves and witchcraft and for fathers and sons sleeping with the same woman and many other delightful things. Just go and read Amos and Two Kings. It'll make your hair stand on end. What the people of God were getting up to. These are not, you know, the Canaanites. These are the 10 tribes of Israel up north. And it is these wicked, idolatrous people who were the ancestors of the Samaritans. And so unsurprisingly, the God-fearing Jews of the South had no time at all for Samaritans. And it's not just that the Jews were racist. I think they were. They hated the race of the Samaritans. But actually, the Samaritans were dodgy. They were dodgy spiritually. Even the way they worshipped their idols was dodgy. It was twisted. It was perverted. It was gross. And they were dodgy morally. Immorality and debauchery was the order of the day up north in Samaria. Once Jesus shared a story, do you remember? Well, he shared the gospel with a, with a woman at a well. Do you remember that? And it turns out she had already had five husbands, and the man that she was living with, she wasn't married to. And it was no surprise that she was a Samaritan woman. That was normal. Well, not quite normal, but you would expect it from a Samaritan. Actually, when the Jews are at their wits end with Jesus in John chapter 8, they just start slating him. They just start insulting him. You know, when you can't bring a, a decent case against someone, you just insult them. You just assassinate their character. And they start calling Jesus a Samaritan. Surprise, surprise. You are demon-possessed and a Samaritan, they say to Jesus. You see, to the Jews of the South, there's no such thing as a good Samaritan, which is why Jesus' parable caused such a stir. The only good Samaritan in the eyes of the Jews was a dead Samaritan. And because the gospel is for outsiders too, 
Philip packs his bags and he heads off to Samaria to tell the Samaritans about God's amazing love and that Jesus had come and died for their sins too. We read that in verse 5. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. You need to understand that what Philip does here is absolutely outrageous. And it raises two questions for us. Would these idolatrous Samaritan people who had a completely different religious system and completely different morals, would they accept Jesus as their God and their Messiah? Would they turn their backs on their idols and become Christians? But the second question is that in the unlikely event that they did become Christians, how would the Jewish Christians respond to them? Would Samaritan Christians be welcomed and loved and embraced by the church? Which, remember, at this stage is made up exclusively of Jews like Peter and John and Stephen and Philip, who actually hated Samaritans. The Samaritans that Philip speaks to are very much the outsiders. The equivalent, I suppose, for us today would be those who throw the bones, those who worship the ancestors, activists for the LGBTQI plus culture, people who follow numerology or Wicca or shamanism. Do you know that shamanism is the fastest growing religion in England and Wales today? Amazing. I wonder how people like this would be treated if they came to our church and started arriving in numbers. How would we treat them? This is the challenge facing the Jewish church in our story. The Jews are going to need some serious convincing to accept the Samaritans. And so Philip believed that the gospel is for outsiders too. But secondly, Jesus, we see, welcomes outsiders like us into his church. You see, when we read chapter 8 about these Samaritans, we are not supposed to think that Philip went to them, you know, those people, the outsiders. We're supposed to be seeing that Philip went to people like us, for we are the outsiders. I don't know about you, I don't have a drop of Jewish blood in me. I have absolutely no Jewish heritage whatsoever. I, I have nothing to do with the promises of God, the covenants of God. And yet here I am, as an outsider, now a member of the kingdom of God. It has always been God's intention for people from all nations and tribes and cultures and backgrounds to become part of his family. But for thousands of years up to this point, God had been dealing primarily with the Israelites. He had first revealed himself to them. He had given his word, the scriptures, to them. It was going to be through them that he would provide the world with a Messiah and a Savior. They were the chosen people, not because they were nice or because they were the only ones he would ever choose, but he chose them to be the people through whom he would make a way for us, the outsiders, to be saved and to become part of his kingdom. We are actually the Samaritans in the story. We are those who come from different cultures and backgrounds and different religions. Amongst us are ex-atheists. You're looking at one. Ex-Hindus. Uh, I, I can see one. Uh, Ex-Muslims. Ex-Freemasons. Ex-Ancestor worshippers. Among us are people who lived immorally before they got married. And amongst us are those who have not been faithful since they've been married. Amongst us, there will be the egomaniacs like Simon the Sorcerer. There will be those struggling with addictions and destructive habits. There will be those who have stolen things that didn't belong to them. There could even be people amongst us who were terrorists and who are murderers. I actually know more than one murderer who has become a Christian. There was a murderer who studied through George Whitfield College by correspondence while I was there. And he was released from prison to come under police guard to the graduation, to my graduation. There he was. Uh, they, they took the handcuffs off. He was allowed to be, walk up and be capped before they took him back to Paulsmore. You see, whether you're a covetous person or a greedy person or an ungrateful person or an adulterer or a thief or a murderer or maybe just someone who has lived without giving the king of the universe a second thought, we are all Samaritans, 
We are all outsiders to the covenants of God, to the kingdom of God. And so God is going to have to do something pretty radical to bring people like us into his family. But God did something pretty radical in Samaria that day. Philip's message to the Samaritan, you might have noticed, is exactly the same message that the apostles were preaching to the Jews in Jerusalem. Verse 5 says that Philip proclaimed the Messiah there, there in Samaria. In other words, Philip told the Samaritans about God's love for them and how Jesus, the king of God's kingdom, had come and died as a sacrifice for their sins. And that all that is left for us to do is to bow the knee to Jesus and worship him as our creator and rescuer. And then in verse 6, verse 7, we see that the Samaritans get exactly the same miracles as the Jews got in Jerusalem at Pentecost. Uh, well, not just Pentecost, for the first six or seven chapters. We read in verse 7, with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. No wonder verse 6 says, when the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. I think I would have as well. But basically what we're reading about here in chapter 8 is a replay of what had been going on in Jerusalem for the last six or seven chapters. Except for one thing. Did you notice it? In verse 16 we read, the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of the Samaritans. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, the Samaritans experienced everything the Jews experienced at Pentecost, except they had not received the Holy Spirit like the Jewish believers had. They had both heard the message that Jesus is our king. They had both believed the message that Jesus is our king. They had both acted on the message that Jesus is our king. They had both turned from the religion of their ancestors and become Christians. They'd even both been baptized. And yet the Jews received the Holy Spirit, but the Samaritans did not. So what is going on here? In Acts chapter 2, hadn't Peter promised, made a promise to the crowds, uh, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, in places like Howick, Samaria, Australia, far off people, not Jews, for all whom the Lord our God is going to call. And that's exactly what had happened. The Holy Spirit was given immediately to those in Jerusalem who repented and who were baptized. But here are some people who are far off, who also repented and were baptized, but they don't receive the gift of the Spirit. Well, not immediately anyway. In verse 17, we read that it was only when Peter and John placed their hands on the Samaritans that they received the Holy Spirit. Maybe Philip, he's just a deacon, you know, he's not fancy, he's not a presbyter. Maybe he didn't have the power to dispense the Holy Spirit. Maybe Jesus only gives people the Holy Spirit if an apostle comes and lays their hands on you. Maybe the Anglicans and the Charismatics and the Pentecostals are right, and that the Holy Spirit only properly fills Christians sometime later after their conversion. But actually, it's none of those things. The truth is that what Peter has done preaching the gospel to the Samaritans was so outrageous that the Jews would never have believed that God accepts Samaritans unless the leaders had seen it with their own eyes. And so Jesus delays the giving of the Holy Spirit until the apostles arrive from Jerusalem to witness the strange thing for themselves, God forgiving Samaritans. It was unthinkable for a Jew in the first century. Actually, exactly the same thing happens when the gospel crosses over to reach the Gentiles with the centurion in chapter 6. Again, there's this delay in the giving of the Spirit until the apostles again have to come and see this with their own eyes. The fact that God has not only accepted Samaritans into heaven, heaven forbid he's also accepting Gentiles. Who would want to be in heaven with Gentiles? So this, friends, is highly unusual 
what we're reading about here in chapter 8 and in chapter 10. These are the exceptions. These are the only two times in the whole Bible where there is any delay between people receiving Jesus and becoming Christians and him sending the Holy Spirit to live in them. Ephesians says that the minute you believe, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Romans goes so far to say, as to say that if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're simply not a Christian. In other words, you don't find Christians who don't have the Holy Spirit. Jesus delayed giving these Samaritan believers the promised Holy Spirit to show the apostles that he even welcomes outsiders like us, like Samaritans, into his church. Friends, if this hadn't been witnessed by the apostles, today there would be two Christian churches in the world. One for Jews, well, ex-Jews, Jews who received Christ, and one for the rest of us. And the church would have developed along two separate streams, and they would never have crossed. They would never have met. But what we see happening here is Jesus expanding the church that started in Jerusalem to now start including outsiders like Samaritans. And Jesus expects the apostles and the rest of the church to welcome and love and embrace these new unexpected arrivals in the kingdom of God. I hope that we would welcome and love and embrace anyone and everyone whom God draws into our church, no matter what race or ethnicity or culture or previous religion they might come from, no matter what background or lifestyle they come out of. I hope they would be able to find a home here with us. And then Luke goes on to give us a little case study, uh, the story of one particularly interesting convert, Simon the sorcerer, the guy from whom we get the English word simony from. You know simony? The buying and selling of religious objects or paid positions in the church. You'll see why in a minute. Have a look at verse 9. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had, had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. Simon himself, though, believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. So we have this wonderful story of a conversion. Simon wasn't just a magician, someone you know who uses sleight of hand and illusion to make rabbits pop out of hats. Now he was a sorcerer, we are told, not an illusionist. He was like Balaam. He was like a New Testament version of Balaam of the Old Testament. Someone who had become a celebrity and very rich because of his dark demonic powers. He dabbled with the occult and we we're told that he decided it was quite nice to be called the great power of God. How blasphemous is that? Again, this is a reminder that these Samaritans weren't only ethnically and culturally different, they were still into all this occultic and wicked practices that had brought the wrath of God down on their heads of their ancestors hundreds of years before. But when Simon the sorcerer hears the gospel, it seems that he genuinely believes, and he's miraculously saved and welcomed into the church. However, not only is Simon an example of someone who is wonderfully saved by the gospel, he's also an example of what God expects from his people. And so the gospel is for outsiders too. Jesus welcomes outsiders like us into his church. And then Jesus expects outsiders like us to leave our old ways behind. So Simon is baptized and welcomed into the church, but when the Holy Spirit comes with the arrival of the apostles, he thinks, well, this is just great. This is wonderful. Here is the real great power of God, the Holy Spirit, demons shrieking, coming out of people, paralyzed people walking. Imagine what people would think if Simon could go around controlling the Spirit of God himself. Maybe he can make a career out of becoming a Christian sorcerer. And so he offers to buy the ability, to practice simony, to pay the apostles, to give him the ability to hand out the Holy Spirit. 
verse 18, when Simon saw that the spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Well, unsurprisingly, he gets a stern rebuke from Peter. Peter said, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray that the Lord, uh, pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. It seems that Simon was genuinely converted, I think. I think so. But his old nature and his old desires are still alive and well. And isn't that true of all of us? Simon had been an egomaniac his whole life, liking to be called the great power of God. He had sold his soul to the devil so that he could be called the great power of God. And that doesn't change overnight just because you become a Christian. But now he has become a Christian, and now some things are going to have to change, says Peter. For instance, you can't become a child of God and a servant of Jesus Christ and still go around calling yourself the great power of God. That just wouldn't be right. So it is true that the church must welcome people from every community and from all backgrounds and lifestyles through our doors. Jesus does call us, doesn't he, to come to him just as we are. We sing that song, don't we? Just as I am. You don't have to get right with God and become a holy Joe before Jesus will welcome you and forgive you. If you had to do that, you wouldn't need to be forgiven, would you? No, you're saved because of what Jesus has done for you, not because of what you go and do for God. But Simon learned that once you've been saved and forgiven and accepted by Jesus, then you need to put aside the habits and practices that offend Jesus and that once alienated you from him. In other words, everyone's welcome, but everyone is called to repent. And that's the word Peter uses in verse 22. Repent, he says to Simon, of this wickedness and pray to the Lord that he may forgive you. To repent simply means putting Christ first. It means stopping living with you as your king and God and starting to live with Jesus as your new king and your new God. And this is something that Christians need to struggle with their whole lives. You can be in the Christian community as an ex-Muslim, but you have to stop being a Muslim. You can't worship Allah as the one true God once you discover that Jesus is the one true God. You can be in the Christian community as an ex-adulterer. There are many forgiven adulterers in the church, but you've got to give up adultery and live with Jesus as your new king and your new God. You can be in the Christian community as an ex-sexually immoral straight person or an ex-sexually immoral gay person. But you can't claim that Jesus is your new king and your new God, and yet carry on living in a way that grieves him. You get the idea? The same thing goes for someone who uses obscene language, or someone who eats too much, or drinks too much, or who is callous, or disagreeable, or proud, or divisive, or greedy, or short-tempered. None of these things are any better or any worse than any of the others. It's just that Jesus is grieved when he sees them and his people. I know these things come naturally to us, and some people might even say, I can't help it. I was born like this. I've just got a short temper. You've just got to put up with me. But friends, if Jesus really has rescued you, and it's now your new king and your new God and your new friend, well, friends, you are to go to war against the things that grieve Christ. That's what Colossians 3 says. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. You see, I put to, we are actually to become murderers. We are to do violence as Christians. We are to go to war against these things. Paul goes on, you used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. But the good news, friends, is that you don't have to go to war on your own. 
The whole reason Peter and John had to travel to Samaria was to witness Jesus giving his new people, people like Simon the sorcerer, the Holy Spirit. And one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to empower us to go to war against the old habits and personality traits that once marked us out as not being children of God. There's a wonderful promise in 2 Corinthians that God will be at work in his people by his spirit to make us more and more into the people he wants us to be. For the Lord is the spirit, writes Paul, and everywhere the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You don't have to be a slave any longer to those things that once enslaved you. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him, the Lord, as we are changed into his glorious image. So friends, let's listen to Peter's words to Simon and to us in our passage this morning. Peter says, repent, that is, fight the old nature, put it to death. Turn away and turn instead to Jesus and pray to the Lord. That is, ask Jesus to help you in this fight. You see, you're not on your own. In fact, you can do nothing on your own without him. But if you are a Christian, the spirit of God himself will be empowering you in the fight. So be encouraged to fight. Well, let me wrap up. We've seen that the gospel is indeed for the whole world, even for Samaritans and Europeans and Britons and South Africans. We've seen that God wants us to love and embrace all who come through our doors, even sorcerers, or at least ex-ones. We've also seen that although everyone is invited into the kingdom of God, you can only join his kingdom and his family if you repent. That is, turn to Christ. Accept him as your new king and your new God. And finally, we've seen that you don't have to do all this on your own. Christ himself is waiting to hear your prayer. So turn to him and ask him to forgive you and help you to live this new life, one that brings him honor and glory. All are welcome, but all must change. Let's pray together. Well, Father, we thank you that Christ's sacrifice covers all the sins of our past. Help us to love our neighbors enough to welcome them warmly into our church and tell them about your love and what Jesus did for them. And Father, help us by the Holy Spirit to be a people who are trusting in Christ and repenting daily. Amen. Please let's stand and sing a great old song as we finish off our time. Uh, one of the great anthems of the Rugby World Cup, uh, the tune that is anyway, not the words. Oh God beyond all praising.
much for joining us this morning. Um, don't rush off. There's tea and coffee. Um, uh, help yourself, serve yourself uh, at the back and in the foyer, um, two stations in the foyer. So it'd be great to meet you. If you're a newcomer, do come and chat to me. I'd love to, to meet you. And Andy Hillman will be around the front of a tea to discuss any questions you might have around our car park. Thank you very much and God bless.